veggie channel is the start. The veggie channel is the first step of a long stairway. But at least every action you take is one step nearer. Hello, my name is Noel Sweeney. I'm a barrister. I specialize in criminal law and also human rights and animal rights. So what that means for the average person is I wear a wig and gown and appear in the higher courts in England. For the main part I do both prosecution and defence and hence represent people in criminal trials and appeals. In terms of animals I believe not that there's anything particularly important about law as a subject but in order to get any real change in the status and role of animals you have to use the law. Philosophy is important, psychology is important, science is important but none of them are as important as law. The rest ultimately result merely in talking about a problem. Law is the one subject that offers a solution. What I would like to speak about today is the, an animal's ombudsman and that is a very important concept within constitutional power and law. It started way back in the 19th century where the people of Sweden were not happy about how they were treated and so an ombudsman was appointed in order to protect their rights. My point and position is precisely the same in animals should have an ombudsman to look after their interests. Answering the point that you raise about cruelty that is caused by children who later on become criminals and treat people badly, what you have to understand is, though it is regrettable, it is atavistic for children to be cruel to animals. So I'm not talking about, even though it's undesirable, a child who pulls a cat's tail or throws a stone at a dog. I'm talking about a child who would set a dog on fire, who would slit a dog's throat, and often the family pet. And what you get time and again is a child will witness usually his father or at least a male, a stepfather, abusing women. He in turn will grow up thinking that's the norm. Instead of abusing other women or girls, he will initially abuse animals. Sometimes he will abuse animals all his life. One of the best examples is Albert de Salvo and many people misunderstand what is the reason for him acting as how he did. He witnessed his father, who was a sadistic man, who would mentally and physically and psychologically abuse his wife on a daily basis. Albert de Salvo would see his mother abused in this way. He in turn would imprison animals and fire arrows at them so they had a slow lingering death. When he grew up, he raped perhaps a thousand women murdered excess of 10 women and when he was tried his psychiatrist was asked why did he find an 80 a 90 year old woman attractive to rape her and the answer was he didn't find her attractive at all but that wasn't his purpose his purpose was to be cruel his purpose was to just treat another animal in the way he had treated animals all his life so the woman and the animal was for him no different. It was a symbol of his sadism. But what we misunderstand is this. It's not a question of him getting enjoyment from it as such. It's him being his father revisited. He started being cruel to animals for the same reason anyone who has power of any nature would take advantage of it and treat the powerless with different forms of cruelty. And so if it is the white plantation owner, 
he would treat the slave badly. If it is a man in a position of control over women, say a prostitute, he would treat her badly, in turn treating children badly. And what you do is get someone who is the underdog and always take advantage of their vulnerability. The one people or members of societies who everyone takes advantage of or animals because they have no vote, no voice, no resistance and all they can do is occasionally kick against the pricks as they stand at the gate ready to be slaughtered. I don't believe that the power becomes distorted with somebody who is otherwise an ordinary decent citizen. More importantly, the power the cruelty, the savagery is inherent in us. It's only a decent society that suppresses the savagery, which is why when a situation arises whereby we can be tested, we take advantage of our own natural ability to abuse others. So it is natural to hunt animals to death because we glory in it. It is natural to be cruel to women. It is natural to be cruel to black people and discriminate against them. But it is wrong because it's immoral and the law should thus curb it. I genuinely think it would be possible to protect the animals in future if we take their role and status in society and see that it is wrong how we treat them now because in a hundred years time people will look back and think how did we ever put animals in a vivisection laboratory? How did we put electrodes in their brain? How did we treat them so badly? And how we treated them so badly is this. Think of Dr. Mengele's. There he is in the Nazi concentration camps. And they said, why don't you experiment on animals? He said, I don't need to. I've got another type of vermin. I've got Jews. He was seeing the Jewish people as no different than vermin. He was seeing them as no different than animals. So what he was doing was experimenting on them because they were the best sort of animals. They couldn't argue, they couldn't resist. All they had to do was be tortured to death. If we had someone who represents the animals, a minister of justice, if things happen where they were to be abused, were to be mistreated, if they had a legal personality, then that ombudsman would protect them. What you have to understand is this. Just over a hundred years ago, women had very little, if any, legal rights in England. And what they would do is, once they got married, all their property would become that of their husband. To put it in perspective, less than 80 years ago, in America, in the Supreme Court of Massachusetts, they had a case where, in order to sit on a jury, you had to be a person. And so, the judges, all men, had to decide whether a woman was a person. They decided she was not. They then had another case where they wondered whether a non-white person could testify again in America against a white American. And he was Chinese. They said, no, he's Chinese. He's an animal. Well, although we have made slow progress, we have made some progress. You know, not that long ago, perhaps 30 years here in Bristol you would see placards in a newsagent's window and in the landlady's window saying no coloureds, no dogs, no Irish. <laughs> so they put the Irish after the dogs. Now they have Race Relations Act, now they have Sex Discrimination Act, now we have equality men, women, we have people who protect those who are discriminated against because of their colour, because of their ethnicity, because of their sex. We have people to protect those who are insane, those who are old, those who are children. We have bodies and ministers within our society to protect every single vulnerable group that exists, except animals. They are the underdog's underdog. 
there are certainly numerous very worthy and worthwhile animal welfare, animal rights organisations within the United Kingdom. Uh, the oldest perhaps is the RSPCA, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, which was started in 1824, so almost 200 years old. You have more recent ones, Animal Aid, you have Viva here in Bristol, uh, you have the BUAV for anti-vivisection, you have the NAVS for anti-vivisection. In total, all of these bodies, plus the League Against Cruel Sports, must be well over a million, could be two million people in various guises. Together, they would be a formidable group. What they should do is not just concentrate on one small area, but band together and use their power for the powerless, because then they would truly speak for those who have no human tongue. I could see that there can be difficulties because some people would want to abolish vivisection, others might say, oh well some experiments are useful, let's keep those if they have medical advancement. Some people would say they should be totally vegetarian so we shouldn't have any welfare for the farm animals, we should abolish them eating the farm animals. The crucial question that all of these organisations could and should answer, and hence all society should answer, is this. And there's no escape from it. Why do we treat animals the way that we do anyway? And the answer to that is, we are conspirators. You are cruel, I am cruel, we are all cruel, and we take advantage of animals because we can. That's the only single reason. It's the same reason why the slave owner took advantage of the slaves. The same reason the plantation owner took advantage of the black people. The same reason there were wife who, wives who were sold, but not husbands who were sold. The same reason the Nazi philosophy towards the Jews. What we have is a Nazi philosophy towards all animals. So they count for nothing in our society because without them just think about it if we changed the law and gave animals rights before you know it as with the plantation owner says well who's going to pick my cotton we'd say well who's going to fill my plate who's going to fill my belly who's going to give me clothes and so it is very inconvenient for us so it's so much easier and better that we remain conspirators and let me just ask you to consider this, and you will see it in one. The Holocaust is a phrase used all the while about the Jewish uh, annihilation in the Second World War. Six million Jews perished as the Holocaust. Interestingly and significant, the origin of the word Holocaust is the slaughter of the animals. What does it mean? It means slaughter of the animals. And so we have slaughtered billions and billions of animals. The Jews are just one isolated incident in that regard, regrettable and wrong though it is. I see now that there are many people who are coming together and can see that a political party is really the future because if you have a political party what you're doing is introducing legislation and then you're using the real mechanism the real instrument of change in our society and indeed the world which is law animals count which is a very good organization started in holland and now coming into england where they have mps who specifically are in favour of animal rights. So what they are doing is saying no different than particular people within our society should be properly represented, like the Green Party may be in favour of the environment and the planet. With Animals Count, as is the name, they're saying we believe animals count for something and to that extent this is the first face of the future. The main political party that I'm aware of is in uh, 
Holland with the Animals Count where there in 2006-2007 they had two MPs who were elected which is the first political party in the world for specifically animal rights. You also have progress in this respect. In Austria they have solicitors for animals. In Germany they have animal rights as a phrase within the constitution and in Switzerland at present they are having thoughts on a referendum so that there will be advocates for animals. So the point being you will have lawyers representing animals not just as an ordinary case but almost an ombudsman which is the very future I advocate. If you are talking about making it just the United Kingdom or making it more global and especially in terms of Europe whilst England may have led the way in terms of history because one of the first pieces of animal legislation in the world was the Ill Treatment of Cattle Act in 1822 started by an Irish barrister but introduced in England now we have various European countries who are much more advanced than England so to that extent we can learn from them the one positive thing you have in England is you have an empathy and a spirit towards animal welfare towards animal rights but what we shouldn't do is settle for animal welfare because animal welfare results in bigger cages so that they have more room to move animal rights means they have a right to life and with rights you have legal status. I see in terms of how if you have strengthening position legally for animals, now it always has to be legally, it can't just be some will or whim, some capricious act of kindness, it has to be something that we have to do by law. Now you can take a strong point on that from Martin Luther King himself. When he introduced the rights in America for the black man with regard to integration rather than segregation, his response in effect was, although it won't make the white redneck love me, it'll at least mean I won't be lynched by him. Now the same thing, it may not mean that all people will love animals, but it will mean that they'll start to think about the animal's feelings. They'll start to think about the animal's pain. They'll start to think about how animals should live and die. No different than how humans live and die. And what you have to understand is this. If we treat animals badly, when we treat other humans badly, if we treat animals well, that would mean all of society would gain because within human rights it would also advance animal rights. And if we treat animals kindly, we would bring children up to see them as being simply a different species, no more, no less entitled to life. Hence, the gain would be twofold. People would be kinder and animals would have a legal status. Well, you mentioned Gandhi and wonder if he was a good influence. Strange thing about Gandhi, and I won't hold it against him, he was a barrister. You may or may not know that. He trained in London as a barrister. Uh, but when he was visiting the United Kingdom, he was once asked, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, what do you think about Western civilization? And he answered so cunningly, it would be a good idea it would still be a good idea. The only thing I would add is this, which is something that we have to grasp and then you will see the power of why animals should be given rights and how our present position is wrong, is this. If you have an animal in a Chinese cage in a market there's going to be a politician's dinner. If you have an animal in a vivisection laboratory going to be tortured to death, and if you have an animal at your granny's feet, what's the difference? And the real answer, of course, is there is no difference because one man's meat is another animal's life. What I would suggest you could do in Italy 
which would make people think more about the animals and the effect animals can have in their lifestyle, in their society, is this. There are many people now who refrain from eating animals and as a result they are calmer, they are of a quieter disposition. What it means is your digestion system is not full of cholesterol, not full of fat, you are healthier in every way. So even on that aspect it is advantageous. Quite separately and without wishing to uh, feel in any way superior morally it is so much better because what it means is you are having a kindness that you're showing towards animals you are then indicating to the children that they should be kind to animals and what you do is you see a child who is cruel to animals that we discussed before may grow up to be a rapist a killer a child that is kind to animals will grow up with that strain of kindness as part of his character. Now that is so much better in every way and that is the future. It is sometimes harder to be kind but it is sometimes without question better. And the veggie channel is the start. The veggie channel is the first step of a long stairway but at least every action you take is one step nearer.